Welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I am delighted to introduce you to Mark Organ. Mark uh, founded the marketing automation movement, uh, as we know it, as the founding CEO of Eloqua, then created a customer marketing movement as a founding and founder and CEO of Influitive, and now is helping folks like myself who want to build new categories that matter as a CEO coach and a B2B leader coach at Category Knots. Mark, welcome to the pod. Thank you, I'm thrilled to be here. And I have to say that um, I, while we haven't met until until this, I've been a, a you know secret fanboy of uh, your products. I was a marketer at Success Factors. I discovered this thing called Eloqua uh, that you've built and it helped us uh, be much more intelligent at the time and like leading leading the market at the time and how we were creating our category around um, uh, employee performance uh, management solutions. And then we changed that category a few times. So you, let, let's hear from you, you know, the origins of, um, of, of the, 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 the idea behind um, um, obviously Eloqua and broadly, how do you see this evolve into kind of the buying experience space, which you at the time really made it simpler compared to the alternatives that were present? Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a great story. And it's so interesting that I'm here um, for experience focused leaders, because really from the beginning, that was really my insight was that both the buying experience and the selling experience uh, was that great. Yeah. Um, and that was so at the time, myself and um, and and uh, one of my co-founders, Steve Woods, CTO, uh, founding CTO at um, Eloqua, um, we we both had some insights around this. Myself more around the selling side, where um, the the experience of sellers was really pretty poor. Uh, they were often talking to prospects that weren't interested in buying. Yeah, and so that was annoying for buyers and also pretty dejecting for uh the the sellers um right and at the so you basically time, the early version of cold calling you know that interrupts the 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 buyer actually non-buyer more often than not because they were not even interested in the solution and it's sort right. of seen as an annoyance and then destroys the willingness to live for an average sales development rep because they're just kind of getting rejected more often than they have to be. Is that kind of a good way? I, of... Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So that, yeah. that experience for both the buyer and seller is not great. At the same time, like uh, Steve uh, gave himself a challenge around buying all his Christmas presents online. This is back in 1999. And he found that he couldn't really do it. He couldn't do it because he needed the advice and uh, the service of you know of of a salesperson so we kind of came together with these insights and said you know there's got to be a way to have a better experience for both seller and buyer and the internet's probably a key way to do that and that's part of the i guess some of the research that i did when i was at bain um was that uh the internet was emerging both both the web and email were emerging as um a a place for buyers to go when they were, you know, interested, um, you know, in buying something. So uh, those are our foundational insights. But the product that we created first uh, didn't look anything like the marketing automation software that you may recognize. It actually was like a chat product, a proactive chat product, a lot like what you might find with Intercom today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or a live person, there's a number of uh, Olar, mm -hmm. a number of, Drift, of mm -hmm. providers out there that do it. That was actually the original product. And the idea was to connect um, a buyer that was really interested because they looked at lots of different things online. They lingered on the right places um, and so on to connect that person with a salesperson live on the website was the idea. So literally an embodiment of the foundational insights of the company uh, was, was the idea. As it turns out, that experience was not necessarily great for sellers or um you know or buyers and so we thought well maybe we just need to turn up the volume and get more uh, prospects so that um the experience may be better for sellers our first customer was uh what's now cushman and wakefield so the number one mm -hmm. commercial real estate company uh so it was it was b2b right from the beginning 
And so, you know, those sellers are making you know a lot of money and they don't want to talk to random people on the internet. Um, but when we put the email engine on top of it, um, what we got then was a, a list of people that were interested in a certain property uh, and we could rank it based on how much interest that they had. So that became really interesting. So now the sellers could actually call the first three or four folks in order. That actually became the minimal viable product um, of the company. So it was kind of lucky that the because we were focused on B2B and, and it was a proactive chat product, we, we needed all this pretty sophisticated analytics to understand um, what... Um, uh, you know, what territory a prospect was in, what they were interested in, so we could connect them with the right person. And as a result, we built a product that was completely different from everything else at the time, like different from every other marketing automation tool, mm -hmm. different from other chat tools, different from other email marketing tools, because of the target market that we had and the problem that we were trying to solve ended up being really different. Now, what was interesting, though, was that nobody else thought this was interesting at all. So all the analysts mm. thought we were crazy and that we were in all these different categories. It didn't make any sense. Um, no VC would fund us. So Eloqua was a bootstrapped company. We raised $166,000 and we That's got it. profitable. Wow. That's it. We got wow. profitable on that. Um, we did have to go to the well and get another quarter million dollars of debt, which was a, a very, very, very dilutive debt <laughs> that we had mm. to do uh, to stay alive. But a lot of the VCs, like we didn't make any sense to them because they're like, are you a web analytics company? And like, no, we're not. But you have web analytics technology. That's true. But that's not what we're interested in at all. Are you an email marketing company? No. Um, what we are is we're, you know, we are a prospect De development and identification Active company identification right and and, that's and were you really doing activation you were doing activation at that time right like or is that did that emerge over time or were you just like really identifying first who is what interested in what or did you start um nurturing you know in the early stages of yeah. the but I, I wish I could say how brilliant we were and that, yeah. how we discovered this category the bottom line the, the truth is that we had no idea what we were doing at all right, um, right. like uh, most uh you know early stage companies where the oldest person in the company was 25 um you know we were honestly just trying to survive another quarter we, we were a bootstrapped company uh we were barely surviving we almost went bankrupt four times mm. um and so uh you know it, and i could definitely tell the story of sort of how we got profitable but it, it actually wasn't until we by accident discovered who we were and it's because we won a, a really interesting customer called jboss mm -hmm. and and jboss was one of the leaders in open source software at the time so their peers uh not competitors but peers would be companies like red hat uh as an example um or or my is mm -hmm. another one right these are open source application companies and so we won JBoss and open source software companies are different from your typical software companies in that they don't really have to generate more leads. Uh, they need to prioritize which leads are most valuable because they've got zillions of leads. They've got all right. these people using their product for free, their business models to sell them services. And so what happened at JBoss is we inflected the sales like this mm. because before their SDRs were calling on prospects at random right. or whatever, like, oh, this company looks big and interesting. Let's call on them. And all of a sudden they went from that to um, calling the right people in order about the things that they were interested in. Um, and so we actually won almost every open source software company there is. And there's a funny story around this one because yeah. um, Eloqua had no open source in it at all. <laughs> we were a Microsoft shop from top to bottom. And uh, the funniest thing was when uh, we went, I went to North Carolina to Red Hat, which is like the cathedral of open source. Um, and, uh, or maybe Mecca, it's Mecca of open source, which is a better analogy because I came in with a bacon sandwich, <laughs> which is what Eloqua was because we were built on Internet Explorer. We were, um, 
they had to actually buy um, computers that were not Linux just to run our product. So that's a good definition of product market fit. Um, if if a company has to uh, buy their arch enemy in order to use your product, but they needed us, like they they needed us because they needed to do what you know what JBoss did and MySQL did and a number of the other open source software companies. And for um, our audience that doesn't know this, uh, Oracle ended up buying uh, Eloqua eventually for what about a bit, like just under a billion. Just under and, a billion dollars, yeah. Uh, and um, which at the time was a very, very big deal. You know, I think right now it sort of is is a, a different different universe in, in in terms of exits. But um, that's that's double doubly impressive. You know that you 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 had such a compelling um, technology built built yeah. out. Well, well, there's an interesting story about that that actually parallels this red hat story. Um, and I think for the entrepreneurs listening, you know, I, I think this is why it's so important to be constantly developing hypotheses as mm. to who your target market really is. Like, what's the real center of the bullseye? It turns out it was different than we thought it was. Um, you know, what is the real offering that you have? What's the ideal pricing and packaging and messaging? Um, because if you're really listening um, and developing hypotheses a lot and testing them, then the answer becomes clear. And once you get that answer, boom, right? At that point, we knew exactly who we were, how to message. We changed our pricing. We changed our packaging. We changed our messaging. Um, and we started to grow faster even before we raised money. We were growing faster on a bigger base because we figured out, again, completely by accident, like the same way that, you know, post-it notes were an accident, right? No. But there was a smart scientist who said, hey, hang on a second. This adhesive that's not actually very good adhesive may actually be useful for something else. And, and I think a good entrepreneur is, is thinking about that too. But with respect to Oracle, the reason why they bought the company, you mentioned that you were uh, in, in uh, HR or employees software, right? So you're probably familiar with success factors. Well, I, that's, where I, that's where I was, yeah. Okay, so here's yeah. a funny story yes. about success factors at Oracle. And I guess I can say this now, I've, probably for a while, you probably couldn't say this in public, but... Um, uh, as Oracle likes to do, they botched that acquisition of success factors big time um, because they uh, actually turned off their revenue engine, which was Salesforce and Eloqua and some other tools. And they said, we should use our own fusion tools. Um, and and they, they, they really destroyed over a billion dollars of value because, you know, Safra Cat said, hey, what is going on? Like, Success Factors was doing this, and now it's doing this. What happened? And you so, mean you mean you know, PeopleSoft? You mean Mark? You mean PeopleSoft? Just to clarify, right? I think. You mean uh, people. Sorry, I, I thought it was I thought it was Success I, Factors. Um, I mean, did, did Oracle buy Success Factors? It was it was people. They bought PeopleSoft, and SAP bought Success Factors. Uh, oh right, right. But right, I think right. you're. I think what you mean is PeopleSoft because they, I, the, right. the, this sorry. makes perfect I'm, sense. I'm at people, yeah, right. I'm yeah. at PeopleSoft. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, you know, it, what happened? And then the revenue leader said, well, you turned off a revenue engine. You turned off the engine, yeah. Yeah. And so well, what's in that engine? And they're like, well, Salesforce, we're not going to buy a Salesforce. Oh, what's this Eloqua thing? Um, and, and it turns out, you know, Eloqua did have a partnership with Oracle. And I said, uh, well, let's just go buy that. Um, so it, it's. Uh, ah, I didn't know that. That is actually pretty legendary. That that makes, yeah, that makes a ton it, of sense. Yeah. yeah. You know, again. This is why we do pod. Is why people should listen to your podcast. Is they this can is, find this secrets is like, that are not available. Our first else. ever known history of like what I, and um, it is it is fascinating uh, as well, kind of because for, for, from an outsider perspective, right? Like so, the when people think marketing automation, they think Eloqua, Marketo, and then like HubSpot in the sort of SMB world. And if, if eventually they kind of Marketo moved up market, and you know HubSpot is moving up market. But guide us a little bit because people say marketing automation and they kind of immediately blur out these companies. But it did sound like you had a very different focus and Marketo had a different focus. And how do you negotiate these areas where you compete or where you just really go in the different directions? Like, like what's for an outsider, uh, what was it like uh, to be in your shoes and thinking about competition in this market? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, you know, Eloqua was founded seven-ish years before Marketo and HubSpot, um, and had quite a quite a a lead on them. I think um, 
Phil Fernandez and uh, and John Miller were very much aware of Eloqua. And I know that because somebody actually showed me their pitch deck, <laughs> which kind of had Eloqua and a bullseye. Um, and, and they did a great job. Like they did a good job of attacking Eloqua at its weak spot, which was the user experience. Um, mm. You know, um, you know, God bless the amazing technical team that I had at, at Eloqua. Uh, uh, lots of fabulous architects. They built an incredibly scalable, still the most scalable Mm -hmm. marketing automation platform in the world it still creams marketo at mm -hmm. at that particular thing um but the user experience wasn't great it was a while before we invested in product management or design right. uh, we yeah. were we were a heavy heavy engineering focused shop um and based in toronto you know whereas um uh hubspot in boston and then marketo in silicon valley uh, have a long legacy of investing in things like product management and design mm -hmm. uh, and, and created more elegant, I think more elegant products. And ultimately, I think that's what the market, um, the meat of the market really needed. I think the high end of the market where you have, um, you know, where you had people who wanted to create 150 different nurture platforms. This is like Megan right. Eisenberg and she's right. it's kind of become legendary uh, in yeah. our space, you know, uh, there's that DocuSign and then MongoDB and whatever, you know, 150, 200 different nurture streams for every little part of the market. Really, uh, Elk was the only product that works for that. And that really was a big part of my strategy um, was that uh, I believe that the high end of the market was uh, where the profits were. And actually, I think I was right. Um, yeah. You know, the, the problem is, is that everyone else knows that too, right? So um of course the high end of the market is where you want to be of course there's a lot of profit there you know the the problem and this was really the ceo who succeeded me who both did a great job but also missed the boat on a couple of things depending on what you think the goal is you know he helped take the company public which is great mm -hmm. but ceded overall leadership to marketo at the end um and that is like when you run up, when you run away further up market, it creates a vacuum yeah. that the lower, and we see this in time after time, right? Like Rolls Royce, you know, keeps running away up market and now their market segment is really tiny. Of course, that they may be very strong in that, in that segment, you know, competing with Bugatti, but that's a very, very tiny segment of the market versus like Toyota that has a much bigger part of the market. So I think the strategy um, that came after me, like I wanted to fight down below. For the mid-market, you wanted to. Yeah, not necessarily, not necessarily to win it because yeah. you can't win everything. I wanted to create what's called a fighting brand, right? So you create a fighting brand so that companies like Marketo and HubSpot have a difficult time getting too much oxygen. Um, but I think what happened, uh, you know, after I left 2007 um, was that, hey, uh, and at the time there was a recession. So I get it. 2008, there's a recession. Let's focus on the most profitable segments, which is the high end of the market. Yeah, that did leave a vacuum. So in the end, everyone actually did succeed. Like Eloqua did go public. So the shareholders of the company got, I think, what it is that they wanted. Um, Marketo also won. They actually end up with a bigger market cap and then going public later. Ultimately, I think they ended up being the category king. Um, but uh, a lot of that is 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 because of uh, of timing. And maybe if I executed my strategy of creating a fighting brand, that might have also diluted the focus of the company. And maybe we might have lost control over the high end of the market. Who knows? Right. Because right. it didn't happen. Well, congratulations. One way or another, you've, you've basically shaped the category. People copied you and you've, you've had a great um, exit. And I think one of the things that really intrigues me is your next uh, next company, Influitive, what, took some of the lessons of what does it take to bootstrap an enterprise company, right? Which is you have to work off of the word of mouth of successful customers and have them be your champions. This is something that's near and dear to our heart, yeah. and and I think a lot of our audience is is kind of realizing now, especially in this market environment, that you know the the best salespeople are not the salespeople; they are your customers, right? Whether they're yeah. like in our case, they're creating with us, 
And that may just speak for itself, or if they say some ni something nice, that's way more credible. We love Godar and G2, which has created a platform for customers to kind of say their uh, publicly share what they say. And you've created Influitive. So tell us a little bit about what are some of the reasons that drove you to do that and you know go go at it again, which you know, as we know, entrepreneurial journey is not for the faint of heart. Um yeah, I'd love yeah, to hear but, that but, story. But, yeah, and this one is uh you know, now I had some experience behind me. I also had some some time to really think about the lessons that I learned at Eloqua because while I was at Eloqua, for the most part, I was just trying to survive another quarter, as I said. Um, mm. And it really wasn't until I left that I realized some, you know, really important things. Uh, for example, I did learn, uh, it's not really related, but the importance of a great employee experience. I only really learned after I left and, and speaking with people how how much I really could have done a better job there. And I think that is one area where I did do a better job when I was at Influitive. Um, but the the insight for uh, Influitive did come from my experience at Eloqua, where uh, we noticed something interesting. And that is that the best quality customers came through a customer channel. So in other words, when we mm. got a referral, and you probably have seen this at, at Relay Toe, and probably uh, every listener in this podcast has seen us in their own business and that is when they get a referral a high-end referral um, those are really good prospects they close mm. faster they close for a higher amount they adopt the solution faster uh, and actually they're more likely to become a customer advocate themselves it's like customer advocacy is like kind of a beneficial virus that way yeah yeah um, and uh, you know not just referrals you know um if you want to close deals faster, if you get a reference call, one-to-one -one reference call in there, they close faster. If you've got the right case studies on your website, if you've got now you've got G2 um, and Trust Radius and, and Gartner Peer Insights type of things going on, when, when prospects are seeing those and it resonates with them, they're much more likely to become uh, not just a customer, but a successful customer. So this is something that we uh, realized, like many other companies that many other leaders do and so the question is well how do we get more of this how do we get more right. customer advocacy and it turns out it's not an easy problem and you may have noticed that in your own business that you want to get like oh let's double the number of referrals that we get well that's hard um yeah. it's not easy to get more referrals um it's not easy to get customer advocates to sign up to be a reference call um it's not easy to get truly great case studies that convert prospects into customers um and it wasn't until it was kind of an accident that we had a you know i had a user conference um you know the, the marquees is what, what it was back then um mm -hmm. not named not named after me uh, but named after marketing uh and what we noticed was when we provided this amazing experience for customers where you gave them a glass of champagne and a fancy hors d'oeuvre and you and you celebrated them with trophies and videos and all this kind of stuff they came, their reaction was to advocate a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, this is why it's important. Like we got to be paying attention to these things, right? That was really interesting. It was unexpected. Uh, mm. That wasn't our goal. Our goal wasn't to generate advocacy. Our goal was just to celebrate our customers and make them feel good. But what ended up happening was a huge outpouring of advocacy from those people. And that's when a light bulb went off for me that if you make the customer advocacy experience great, you will get more customer advocacy. You know, rocket science, right? Brilliant. Um, you know, that's why we're both in the experience business because providing great experience works and the customer advocacy experience is not the same as the customer experience. Okay, the customer experience means that the product really works. It's mm. got surprise and delight in it. It, it you know, um, the service experience is great. You know, that when people use your product, it does what you expect it to do and a little more, right? That's the customer experience. The customer advocacy experience is different. Mm. Um, you can even get a customer who's not absolutely delighted with your product. So they're not a 10 out of 10. They're like a seven. They will still advocate a lot. You can get a customer who's a 10 out of 10 who's thrilled with your product and not advocate much at all. So there's something else that's going on. And the, the things that I learned about it is what caused me to build another company. Because what I learned was 
um, that the advocacy experience is really different from the customer experience. And I knew that this was going to be a new company. Um, but I wasn't ready to run a new company. I was running the old company. Um, mm -hmm. But then when it was time for me to move on, I really wanted to work on this problem. And the problem was, how do you get happy customers to advocate way more than they ordinarily would? Right. How do you get someone to, to do a referral a week instead of a referral a quarter? How do you do that? Right. Um, and so I interviewed over 800 people. These are 800 people that I would call them like super advocates or people who just enjoy helping companies that they like. Um, and I found out what it was that drove them to do it. And there's three basic things we found out. One was they wanted to be part of the team. Hmm. Um, so they didn't want to have a big demarcation between employee and customer. They want to be part of the team. Part of their identity was uh, infused with this company they cared about. It's almost wow. like Superman, mm -hmm. like Clark Kent and Superman. So in regular life, a customer advocate may be, you know, an accounts payable clerk, um, mm -hmm. you know, deep in the bowels of some big company, right? Or they might be whatever it is. They may be a, you know, they're, they're a sales leader, marketing leader. They're a teacher. Okay. They're, they're Clark Kent. But when they are advocating for a software that is transformational for them and their career, they turn into Superman or Superwoman at mm. that point. Um, and so their identity is is tied up in the company. So we want to make them feel that even more. Right. We really want to make them feel like they're a VIP, that they're part of the team, that they're, you know, not that different from an employee, actually. So that's one of the things we learned. The second is that people wanted to understand the impact they're making on the company. They wanted to make right. an impact. It's one of the reasons why startups get so much more advocacy than the Oracles and the SAPs and the Salesforce.coms of the world. Because if you advocate um, for Salesforce.com, let's say today, you're really not going to make much of an impact. But in the early days of Salesforce.com, they huge, did a huge, was huge, yeah. huge thing, right? It was yeah, a huge yeah. thing. And they did a great job. Of this. The Salesforce yeah. did a great job of customer advocacy. Um, so you want to show people the impact that they're making. So you're you are one of our early customers. You matter. You believe in us. We value that. And then on top of it, you have a new persona of yourself as this sort of super, super woman or super, ma super yeah. man. That's right. And, and you may. And what's the third may, one? Yeah. And you, you even may recall, I mean, sales. I mean, Mark Benioff has got yeah. such a great instinct on this. You may recall the billboards around San Francisco that literally had their customers as superheroes right yeah, on top yeah. of billboards um so yeah that's that's really it. so so they need to show people the impact that they make um and the third thing is that their life should be improved and their career should be improved if they advocate more um so this was a big this was a big insight some companies were really good at this that um you know when people advocated for their company that they prospered so for example um if you want your career to go in the right place, you may want to write some content that is going to be seen by your next employer or, or your existing employer. So you get promoted. Um, you know, you may want to get more public speaking experience and get on stage and mm. show how insightful you are as a leader to use relay to, um, mm. you know, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, if you want to get more advocacy, help your, customer advocates prosper in their life and career. Those are the three things. Um, and it's really again. interesting because they're not transact. Like the last one is a little bit more, you're, you're, you know, you, it could be perceived like it's transactional, but in reality it's not because it's a pleasure. Like I'll tell you right now, yep. like there's nothing more pleasing to a CEO of a founder of a company than to have your users get promoted. It's like, totally. it's such Absolutely. a joy. Like, I don't like, I, you don't have to, I don't have to bet. You don't even have to promote me. You know, like you don't have to promote relate to like zero benefit. It is a joy to see, Hey, this person believed in me in us when we were early, yeah. they took a risk and look at them there. Like they were a director and now they're CMO or they're, yeah. they kind of had low quarter numbers. And then they won the big deal and they used our data to make that. It's just, I, so I, I think, and our team yeah, loves I'm, it, I'm right? So, it's so motivating. I'm so happy to hear that because 
I mean, not only is that a great joy, it's probably one of the best metrics of success that we have. Because look, B2B is, yes, you're between businesses, but these are still people selling to people. And so you've got a buyer on the other side, and especially if you're selling a new piece of technology from a startup organization as maybe a new category, you've got a buyer on the other side that is taking a major risk on you and your vision and your product working. Um, and why are they taking that risk? You know, is it to make their company successful? Yes, in part. And, and, and probably the smaller the company is, the more likely that the buyer's career aspirations is completely lined up and aligned with the company. But when you're getting into, you know, a Fortune 500 company or um, or a government division or something like that, you know, um, there can be a divergence there between the interest of the buyer and the organization. What the buyer is looking for is to prosper. Uh, and, and again, hopefully that's aligned with the company. But they want to get promoted. They want so that um, they can get their job of their dreams by going elsewhere and saying, look at what I've done in my last company. Yeah. Look at the value yeah. I've created. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we always had a celebration whenever our customers were promoted. Uh, we have. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, that's that's actually we, we haven't done that formally. That's a great idea. I wish everybody could kind of uh, write that down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have a celebration. We'd, we'd have the person promoted, record audio or video. We would play that in front of the whole company. We would invite them to our to our all hands meetings. And nothing got people fired, especially engineers. You know, a lot of engineers are kind of jaded. Cynical um, view of the world. Yeah, right? sure yeah. cynical. They've yeah. heard all this before. They're kind of allergic to sales speak. Let me tell you, when you have someone saying, I got promoted because of your amazing technology, um, and everything around it and the whole service and sales experience. And I got promoted. I mean, the engineers just light up. Um, and now they have such a strong sense of purpose. You yeah. know, they're not just slinging code. They are making careers happen, right? They are driving huge amounts of value. Uh, and, you know, if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur, you really want your best engineers to be fired up all yeah. the time and not taking calls from recruiters. Yeah, and I think I think you know we're very privileged, um, and I think many people are maybe that like their product can itself generate meaning. So we are, you know, kind of in the in that extension of the buyer experience journey that you said, like where we can take the you know content that would like you know normally you know suck the suck the light out of you, like reading like two hundred page PDF and, on a phone or something like that, or you know, is really painful to create and you don't feel proud of if you as a creator, we make that come to life. And so we're delighted at that. It's like we're reinventing the book. Um, and so sometimes we can tend to have a, can forget that like we get so excited about our mission that, you know, hey, the, it's separate from that. As exciting as that mission is, whether it's for us or for our customers, there's these people for whom like the, this, this moves the needle uh, of their career as well. Yeah. And I think if you can combine the two, it just feels like it's magical, right? Because you you have a purpose, your customers feel the purpose, it's bigger than the career. It's, it's yeah, there's a calling. Absolutely. But if you can combine this with career, like we live in reality, right? And we want people to succeed and progress. Yeah, Beautiful. no, I think you nailed it there. I think that's great. And, and um, you know, my insight around this, around these special people, right, that have taken this huge risk on us on our companies and our categories to me these are actually the foundation of where the category actually comes from so mm. i have a theory uh, i have a theory of how categories are developed um let's hear it it's because it's you're like from... you're you've been studying this and by the way like mark is a brilliant guy like you, he's bane like most people that go to bain and get degrees in neuroscience they don't they don't they don't, they don't go you know, thinking about categories at an entrepreneurial level. So this is a privilege here. Let's let's hear Thank it. Thank you. Well, you I know. appreciate it. Well, yeah, and I mean, this is uh, everything we've talked about about again, like these special people and um, th these these champions, whatever. I mean, this is really where my theory of the category kind of came from. Um, 
And, and that is uh, the, the category is actually built around a special class of people who think about solving problem differently from everyone else. Mm. Um, and so at, at Eloqua, these were people that were called demand generation. Now, everyone knows that phrase. That was a very weird phrase in 2001, 2002. And so what uh, I noticed when I was going to visit my sort of target prospects or the people interested in us is that they were different from everyone else in marketing. A lot of them came out of engineering as a discipline. Mm. Some of them, some of them came out of sales, sort of very technical sales. A lot of them came out of engineering. And, and what was going on was that you had the CEOs, some visionary CEOs of companies that realized in the early 2000s that the internet was going to change everything in the in go to market. Um, and they looked at their marketing organizations and say, we don't have the people here who get it. Mm. Um, and so they would take someone brilliant from another organization and they would say, you got to figure out how we use the internet to, to drive demand. Because again, at the same time, uh, you know, the rise of the internet as a platform, but also a brutal recession. Right. 2001, 2002, 2003, there's no budget. Marketing budgets were cut by 80, 90%. Um, in some cases, cut to nothing, right? So all of a sudden, we went from a demand-rich environment in 1998, 1999, to a demand-poor environment in 2001, 2002, 2003. And so the CEO said, hey, Use the internet, figure out how to drive more demand, demand proactively. And so we'd go to these people's offices and they would have whiteboards with funnels on it and they would have flow charts and they right. would have formulas. Like they wouldn't have like Pantone colors and slogans. Right. Um, so this is like were, a change in marketing from brand, like maybe product focus to this sort of, to this engineering flow mentality uh, exactly okay got it exactly yeah exactly um and they didn't even say well yeah we're in the marketing department that's not what we do right what we do is we generate demand for a living um so our first category was called demand gen automation it's kind of clumsy demand generation automation it was demand gen automation that was the original category and it was focused on a very small segment of the market Mm. maybe 5%. I mean, it was really tiny. Um, then we noticed something else that was really key to our growth was that a number of our best early prospects, uh, they were subscribers to a, a, a tiny little analyst firm uh, based in uh, Connecticut in a rented storefront over the over a drugstore called Serious Decisions. Mm. Um we were the and literally i drove i flew to hartford i drove uh you know to these guys to see who these guys were because a number of our prospects they read everything that tony jaros wrote over there mm. from series um at the time it was like four people and a dog it was just tiny eloqua was the first vendor to ever partner with serious decisions so serious decisions was focused really just on buyers Mm. and focused on sales and marketing automation, we became the first to partner with them. We, had, we bought an annual thing for $17,000, which was a lot of money for us at the time. That same thing would be 250 k today. Um, but as a result, you know, we, we, it was a symbiotic relationship where serious decisions was talking about our ideas. We were talking about serious decisions, ideas. Um, and um, uh, essentially all we did from that point on is serve these people. That's it, right? So these people in demand gen, we said, we're gonna bet on these people. We think that one day, most of marketing is gonna look like this. It's gonna be more technical, yeah. it's more process oriented. It's gonna have like repeatability, auditability, all these things. We're gonna get away from mushy marketing and towards something that's much more measurable. Turns out that was true. And then all we did was say, okay, we're not just gonna give these people a product. We're going to give them analyst support as a mentioned series of decisions. We're going to give them a community that became top liners. We're going to give them a award ceremony that was Marquis. We're going to give them an ecosystem. Uh, and, and that was app cloud. 
um, and basically just give them everything, these people, everything they needed to accelerate their career. Right. That so what you're insane. saying is there's a persona that's emerging and you're filling it like around a particular trend that's sort of a mega trend. Um, and then you're wrapping, you're then just enabling a combination of the and that persona succeeding and kind of capturing that trend. You didn't invent the trend. The trend was there. Exactly. Uh, didn't you didn't invent the persona. The persona was there. You're just there to serve them in, yeah, in their journey. And, and hopefully you've done a good job and you've picked um, yeah. you've picked something with legs. The great thing about this model of category development is even if you're wrong, you still end up doing okay by dominating a category. Um, and I've I've seen it with uh, this buddy of mine uh, that um, he was a top sales guy at LinkedIn, and then he went to go and help his wife, who was a permanent makeup artist. Um, the, these are people they so women instead of applying makeup they can tattoo makeup on their face. Mm -hmm. So that's what she did. He's like I'm burned out from selling. I'm gonna help my wife out in her little business. Um, and at the time we met, I talked about my ideas around category development. He's like, that's great. I'm going to do the same thing around these people. So all he did and his wife did is serve these permanent makeup artists and give them everything they needed. So not just product, but services, education, certification, uh, uh, an award ceremony, all this like right. the same platform, all the same components that I did at Eloqua. You know, today it's something like a $16 million business has never raised any venture capital at all. He and his wife own 100% of it. They could sell it to private equity today for $60 million. Um, you know, it's a massive outcome. And the, the reason why it's interesting is that there still are not a lot of permanent makeup artists in the world. I mean, that category has grown. It's, still, it's a niche. So it's a niche it's, that you could turn. It's a niche. Down. They just own 80% of that niche, right? And so when you own 80% of something, um, even if that something isn't that big, it's still pretty interesting. But, you know, it's also interesting if you own 30 or 40% of yeah. something that's huge. Um, well, let's talk about something that's big. And I want to quote you from your book, which we didn't talk about. Yeah. Mark is the author of a book called The Messenger is the Message, How to Mobilize Customers and then Leash the Power of Advocate Marketing. But one of the quotes in there is near and dear to our audience, which is relates to kind of overwhelmed uh, attention spans, you know, that, you know, we could say some marketing automation systems are leading to that a little bit these days, you know, <laughs> every technology, it can go a little bit sideways every now and again, but let, let me quote you and let's connect the dots for what's, what do you see going on, particularly around like the content to serve. So this is, this is the quote. In the same way, modern businesses have strip mined, extracted, and trolled the most valuable resource we have, people's times and attention. Once a seemingly endless resource, the attention of a customer is now scarce. Their time fragmented by hundreds of digital distractions a minute, daily onslaught of sales messaging that overflows their inboxes, overwhelms their spirit. I love that. Companies <laughs> must spend exponentially more money than they used to in order to grab that little ascension that's left. This investment generates yields that are barely profitable, completely uneconomic, and worse, dwindling. This is a very sad state of affairs. Um, yeah. I would say that, like what you're describing, was one of the founding ideas behind us that relate to, <laughs> where we're like, look, you know doesn't matter even if you, and let's assume you have great content let's not assume it's some yeah. ai generated spam let's assume this is substance right you know it, people are still overwhelmed so how do you make it digestible and interesting community like trusted because maybe it comes from you know a case study or other things so we were like really deeply interested and i think one of the your contributions is that you make this be real from real customers real people um, these sort of champions that are passionate because they feel like they're on a mission as well. Uh, but tell us more, like if you were to extrapolate this, right? Like you meet 
tons of startups. They're all trying, or, or larger companies, they're all trying to build categories. And for those of you that don't know, like, like you were describing, my experience is you don't just build one category. You build one category, then the slightly other, then another. If you expand and you get lucky, you own a mega category collection of categories and so on, or, or at least definition. So it's an ongoing process, but you're, you know, attention is scarce, right? And the new category... Yeah. I think in some ways it's even tougher, right? Because there is the, there is maybe it's new, but people don't think of themselves yet in that category, maybe, right? So talk talk to us about the challenges and maybe what role can content play in that. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And, and yeah, I mean, at one level, um, it is sad. I mean, one other quote that I have in the book, which is marketers will ruin every party they're invited to. Um, and and it's uh, true, yeah, like, well. <laughs> but once, like once marketers sort of figure out something that works, they just like, you know, yeah. stomp on the gas pedal and they, you know, flood, they flood the zone. Right. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be sad if you're on the right side of that trend. You just have to accept right. that this is what's going to happen. And of course, it's just going to get worse. And it has now with AI driven content. Wow. Even like the last constraint around content proliferation is now gone. You can create unlimited uh, amount of content for almost nothing now. Um, so it just means more than ever, content needs to be highly relevant. And um, and that's why customer-driven content uh, is the best content, right? So I think there's a big interaction between community, which is what Influitive was all about. Influitive is about um, provide, creating a community of your best customers uh, and mobilizing them. Right. And so and one of the things you mobilize them to do is to get involved with content. Mm -hmm. So first thing is, what should we even write about? Right. Uh, a lot of marketers, content marketers guess. They're like, I think we should write about X today. You know, they yeah. they get together in a room and they they have a brainstorming. And let's go write about this. Here's a better idea. Why don't we go out to our best customers and ask them what we should write? Mm. What, what's missing in their life? Let's go and find out. Let's go and write about things that our customers really care about. Um, and then why don't we have, instead of AI writing things, why don't we actually have customers writing things in their own voice? Because you know what? If we want our prospective customers to get um, influenced by our content, wouldn't it be better to have other customers who really know them write that content? And then in terms of dissemination of that content, um, you know, who are you more likely to accept content from a random person or a marketer or your one of your peers? Right. So mm -hmm. um, I think content is absolutely critical to creating a category. Um, and that's been true in every category, you know, even going back to biblical times. Right. There's a content called the Bible, yeah. <laughs> which was really important for Christianity and Judaism. Um, and, and every every religion has its content. Um, every country. Um, it, the United States has founding documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, um, and even things before then, right? These were critical pieces of content that galvanized the early Americans, right, to um, to create that community and fight a war against the largest power in the world at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So content is critical to creating a movement. A yeah. movement is critical to creating a new category. The United States is an entirely new category of country, probably one of the most successful that's ever lived, right? You've never had a republic like the United States before. It's a completely new category. Um, and it was created by people who were galvanized by content. Um, who and, cared and, about uh, content, who cared about yeah. it, and who made sure that, uh, I guess, that the, it was distributed, right? Like, I guess, it, like, there was an engagement around rituals around that the content right so it's actually exactly, yeah. not that just creating it it becomes part of your identity that's fascinating yeah um, yeah so so i think there's actually a big parallel between religions and mm, revolutions mm. right and, and what we're trying to do with uh with new categories i think there's a lot of things that are actually um you know run run in parallel um you know around it and um, but yeah, I say if you you know if you want to create a great category, I would first start with this special group of people who think differently about a problem than other people, right? So whereas you know most people think about, I mean, we create create something. Right? There's a I just discovered an interesting category in gyms. I'm a 
gym goer, right? And most people who build gyms do it a certain way and they have a business model. It's actually not a good business model, you know, where they make money by people paying them and not showing up to the gym. Then some people said, what if we did it differently? What if people paid less by going to the gym more and that we were um, oriented around health and the healthier people were, the less that they pay, mm -hmm. right? So that is a whole different way of thinking. Um, and that there's a group of, of buyers, of gym goers who also think differently, right? So what if, what if we um, serve those people? What if we serve those people who think differently and give them everything that they need for success? That is, to me, what great categories are, are built around um, and less around a disruptive technology. So I think what a lot of entrepreneurs do is say, what's hot today? Artificial intelligence is hot. Drones are hot. 3D yeah. printing is hot. I'm yeah. going to create an, I'm going to create a drone company because drones are hot. Right. So my approach is a little bit different. It's just like, OK, drones are going to get exponentially better, faster, cheaper. Right. One day we can imagine a company that is going to be able to field millions of drones. Who is going to prosper as a result of that? Mm. And so I can imagine, for example, an enterprise drone manager, um, someone who's responsible for like thousands or millions of drones, for example. Um, so you need to do the same thing with AI. Who's going to prosper as a result of AI? Right. So, for example, the prompt engineers. Someone should build a company around prompt engineers, you know, and just serve those people and give them everything they need in order to be successful, which is not just product, it's service, it's community, it's a platform, um, it's, you know, it's award ceremonies, it's career help, it's all of those things. And someone is going to build a multi-billion dollar category around prompt engineers, I'm sure. Um, there probably are a couple that are being founded right now um, out there, as, as opposed to saying, I'm going to build the next big AI company. Um, so that's where I think my approach is. This been. is really interesting. Like one of our guests and kind of uh, friends of relate to um, CEO of Alteryx, Dean Stoker, when he was describing how they were shaping their category of um, kind of, uh, I would say, analytic automation, eventually that's became the kind of uh, the, the category. They were describing yeah. that they were going for the sort of super powerful uh, VLOOKUP Excel power user. Right. That like that is sort of not quite, you know, ready to use the complex business intelligence tools, but like like basically was maximizing what you could do was Excel and they could create superpowers for them. And so they 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 were able to to serve that audience. Um, they still set some power users like the VI types, mm -hmm. but it, but it sort of that was the, the definition. And when he saw what we we're doing, he's like, yeah, yeah, you guys are doing the same thing. You're democratizing the sort of super web-like interactive experiences for the advanced uh, PowerPoint users or advanced InDesign users that are sort of taking those platforms, like whether they're graphic designer or, or kind of presentation designer, taking it to the limit, but they're stuck, right? Like, and they don't, do they want to start learning to code? Probably not. You know, will it serve their problems? Probably not. But you creating this opportunity um, for them to feel much prouder about what they've done, to take their skill set to the new level, to become a no-code citizen designer versus just a you know yeah. PowerPoint um, you know person to who, who gets sent the PowerPoint slides, you know, at the last moment, right? And that was really interesting, aha. And I, like, well, we kind of thought about it, but it wasn't very clear. And it sounds like if I'm connecting the dots, this is exactly what you're kind of advocating find these sort of power users potentially that are underserved but are motivated because they've taken their time to learn what what's the max that they can do with with you know powerpoint or in design whatever other tool yeah. in our unit little universe yeah i agree so, actually I think, I think no code is creating a whole bunch of exciting categories and the reason why it is um I, I, it is a disruptive innovation right because now you're giving non technical people the ability to uh, build really amazing powerful solutions um right so this is for me textbook right now you've got people that are experts in process mm. that make experts in understanding the customer that's their expertise and now we're empowering them with disruptive technology to do 10 times more value than they used to be able to generate and that you can build a category around that, okay? You can, uh, in fact, I've helped a couple of companies build 
categories around process engineers, for lack of a better term, right? Mm. And these are people who use no code technologies in order to create a step function improvement and productivity in their companies. And because of that step function, that allows them to get paid a lot more. I mean, we talked about promotions, yeah. right? Um, one of the things I'm really proud of, both for in both categories that help create the marketing automation was originally around demand gen. Those are people who are paying paid 50 grand a year. Today, they're paying paid a quarter million. Today, uh, more often than not, a CMO, a new CMO today in B2B tech likely has a background demand gen. It's pretty amazing. Mm. Um, and that may be supplanted by the next category created, which is built around the customer marketer. Mm. So customer marketing in 2010 was not a big deal at all. This is not yeah. a place to be marketing. These are the people that wrote the case studies. These are people that did, you know, connected for reference calls that did referral campaigns. Um, but, you know, there were some they were respected at places like Salesforce, right? Like which but not not as as mainstream in the rest of the market. Is that a fair Definitely, statement? Yeah, that's not mainstream, but there were some companies where they really got it. And you mentioned Salesforce. Yeah. And then, you know, my first customer at um, Influitive was Zora. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Teen So, the CEO, was uh, really a right hand man to Mark Benioff. For a while. I learned a lot from him. Um, and, uh, you know, references were critical to close a sale at, at Zora. Um, and, and that's why it became, um, you know, it became our first customer. And actually they took customer marketing very seriously because without the right reference call in a timely fashion, they would not close the deal. So, um, there were some visionaries like teen, um, and some of our other early customers where they took customer marketing really seriously and they had one of their best people on the job, not mm -hmm. one of their sort of also rans. Um, and again, I could see because of trends that were happening. So the trends were exponential increase in content uh, was a big trend, right? The, the trend towards dominance of social media, right? Mm -hmm. Back in 2010, social media wasn't huge yet, right? right. Facebook was only, what, four years old. LinkedIn was five years old. I mean, this was not a uh, bit, but you could see where it was so going you're to connecting the dots. You could start, you're connecting the dots of what, what's exactly. going to create this persona to be more successful of the customer exactly. marketer right? and more successful and more essential. Right. So yeah. uh, I had a theory that customer marketing was going to be huge and it was going to go from being a backwater in marketing organizations to becoming the main event. And you really are seeing that more and more you're seeing where it's becoming a main event. And it has to, because how else are you going to create content that cuts through the clutter? How are you going to make demand gen where people actually respond to emails? Um, how are you going to create product marketing that's effective? I mean, the only way to do this well is you need to get your customers involved in every aspect of the way you do business. And that's why customer marketing is becoming such an important role. Um, and so, and so, yeah, these categories really built around these people and their needs. And I would suggest to any, you know, entrepreneurs that are here listening, if you want to build a company, as opposed to falling in love with the product idea, which is what usually happens, you know, fall in love with um, a, a subcategory or a class of users that are really special, that really think differently. And because of disruptive technology and other trends, their star is going to rise. Bet on these people, just give them everything they need and you can build a really great company. I mean, it takes a little longer, you know, so it takes, you know, in my experience, this is a decade like, uh, you know, which sure. for a lot of a long time. But the great thing is, honestly, it's one foot in front of the other. All you need to do is serve these people and as they grow, you grow along with them. So I think it's a great way to build a company. Well, this is a, this is a fantastic masterclass in going from the origins of particularly was your focus over time on on the the, the marketing field of how it can, different categories emerge. Now, Mark, one last kind of piece of advice. Um, now is a tough time for many marketing organizations, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, uh, customer marketing, as you pointed out, at the or you know, advocate marketing could be more cost effective. In, in many ways, but still, like it's just the environment is hard. New initiatives are hard. 
Um, you, you know, what what's your take on kind of how do you prioritize in this in this environment, right? Like where you're the CEO or you're the CMO um, in sort of in the B2B universe, you know, and you want to be kind of building a category, but at the same time, you know, you've got to take the low hanging fruit um, in, in your kind of go to market. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's a very exciting time. I mean, uh, both companies that I founded were actually in recessions. Uh, uh, Eloqua, a deeper one in 2002, 2003, but, but 2010 and 11 weren't, weren't great years either. Um, but, but I think that's actually an exciting time. This is an exciting time. Um, it's, it's do or die time. You know, um, a lot of companies are not going to make it through what's happening, uh, especially in marketing tech. It's really rough out there. Uh, marketing budgets are really being cut. And I don't think we've seen the end of it because I'm not seeing a lot of bankruptcy yet. So, um, which we saw in 2008, which we saw in 2001, 2002. So I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. But that's an exciting opportunity because if we can just survive, that means that we're going to get to the other side of this and have a chance to build a big company. And so I still think that marketing the category first is a great idea. If you, you know, people still want to buy things that are disruptive, that are going to have the opportunity for a 10x improvement. What I'd say is really critical in this environment is that you need to make your category also about cost reduction and risk reduction. Right. Um, and you need the CFO to be a partner with you um, because right now the CFO is very powerful. They are cutting a lot of spend on technology many cases they have to approve any new technology purchase so we need to partner with those guys um and uh so you know at eloqua we survived in a number of ways one was to identify budgets that were still active mm. and you see it today so um marketing budgets were cut literally many cases to zero in 2002 sales budgets were not cut in some cases even grew because companies said, we're going to invest in our salespeople. We're going to train them well. And so, you know, I made a pitch around how, you know, we really want to serve, you know, help your sales guys. Why don't we get them better leads? Okay. That's a great way to help your sales guys out. And in many cases, we were able to get budget from the sales organization. Because our category at Eloqua was about marketing and sales coming together. Right. 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 Le leads are where marketing and sale come together sales comes together and so we're well, I, like i have one slight corrections i think educated leads right like since you brought up education yeah. that's the cream of the crop right like because i think those are the, the leads that you want that's where the marketing has done maybe some of the job of the sales yeah. and that's actually where marketing and sales come together is to talk yeah. about what great lead is in many yeah. cases at all uh, we so many times we heard marketing sales. We say, you know, this is the first time we've been together in a year to talk about this. Yeah. So, yeah. It, so it, we were where marketing and sales came together, and that allowed us to draw from uh, the the sales budget. Uh, we could also make a claim and say, you know, if you use our technology, you don't need as many people in marketing. You can allocate them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could, you know, oh, you have a direct mail budget. That used to be a thing, right? You can cut your direct mail budget big time. Yeah. So show immediate cost benefits, the same thing at Influitive and said, you know, how about this? You do 20 trade shows a year. How about you do 18 instead of 20 and make every single trade show that you do 50% more effective because you got your customers involved in every aspect of your trade show. We actually um, won a lot of deals through the trade show budget during a kind of mini recession in like 2010, 2011. Um, we, we want a lot that way. So you want to be able to show immediate cost reduction, no increase in budget. Um, and, and you know what? Make your category about that, right? Part of, part of you know, um, customer marketing, excellence customer marketing means that everything you do in marketing is that much more effective. It means you don't need to do as many things. We can do less things. And we're doing less things. It means we're spending less money. And we mm. make each of those things we do more effective. Um, so I'd say for anyone listening in on this call, um, we want to do the same thing with, I, I don't think you want to abandon category marketing. I still think for many of us listening to this call, we're still selling to visionaries. 
We just need to help those visionaries get deals done. And the way to do that is to show immediately co immediate cost and risk reduction right off the bat. This thing should pay for itself in three months. And then everything after that is gravy. If you've got that pitch, you're going to do well in this environment. This is brilliant. And, you know, I'm, I'm like applying some of these things in my own head. And one of the things we've been thinking about but didn't really articulate yet is like, what's the risk, for the career risk, for example, for somebody doing marketing with, you know, downloadable PDFs and things like that, the way they were done, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago in this noisy, different environment, right? And that's, that's a, there's a, there's also a risk of wasted resources, you know, paying ads, you know, to lend people into, you know, a lending page that doesn't convert because, you, you know, the, the, there's nothing enticing at the end of that, at the end of that conversion form and so on. And so, but there, there's a risk to a career of being stagnant. There's a risk uh, to a company, obviously, of being ignored uh, and wasting, you know, ad spend. And so this is a, you know, very real. And I think, you know, two years ago, people would speak about it, but it wasn't, it was all grow, grow, grow. You know, it was it was more like let's jump on this bandwagon. It's new, it's innovative, and especially as you know, marketers sometimes like to try new things. But I think there's a risk of sticking to old habits. And you know, last kind of thing that we didn't cut, touch on, but you have this background in neuroscience. You know, and and I'm just curious to see how how do you see this either affecting communications or community building. You know, like has like there's a lot of work in social psychology, neuroscience that we're yeah. trying to apply. You know, is this giving you this extra laser look at everything that you're doing? Um, and what kind of tips do you have from that kind of that expertise that you can uh, share with marketers and go to market leaders? Sure. Yeah, and I can definitely tell a great story around this. But you know, uh, my work in neuroscience was uh, focused on rats. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're, and they're learning, we all? <laughs> learning memory motion, although th there may be some interesting things to apply from it. But but yeah, I mean, the reason why I got interested in neuroscience in the first place was I was interested in motivation, right? What yeah. is it that motivates? But, you know, once you go in and when I started my PhD, all of a sudden it's like, well, this is your tiny little area of the world that you're going to become experts in. Um, and and uh, and so I was a physiologist. I worked with rats. Um but uh, but still, that interest and motivation, I think, is uh, is interesting because as marketers and salespeople, uh, ultimately, our job is to persuade yeah. people into our way of thinking so that they make a decision to invest more in our ideas. It doesn't mean to buy our product. Right. All we're trying to do, for example, uh, if if I if I right now, what am I doing here on this podcast? What I'm hoping I'm doing is that people who are listening to this are going to find my ideas intriguing and are going to want to invest in them. And that might mean reading a piece of my content. It might mean going to a forum on my website. I mean, um, uh, actually, you know, speaking of that, let's for those that are listening, paying attention. How can people reach you? Mark, yeah. Before we before we do that, <laughs> for, yeah. Well, well, I have a website at, uh, at categoryknots.com. The www.categoryknots.com. Uh, my email address is mark at category knots. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn. You can reach me on Twitter at uh, at, at uh, Mark Oregon on Twitter. Uh, lots of ways to go and and reach me. Um, but but yeah, that's you know what uh, uh, what I'm here to do is to persuade people, and the way to do that is to understand their mental models mm. and be able to work with those men either to change their mental model of, of, of how they think, uh, which I've done hopefully a little bit of that today. Uh, I hope that I've shifted people's thinking on how categories are developed yeah. um, to focus more on the special people who think differently and work with them. That's really right. part of my message today. Um, you know, so, but there's principles of neuroscience, of motivational psychology, of social psychology um, that uh, are at play. And there's some famous books now, you know, so a lot of people have read Influence by Robert Cialdini. Mm -hmm. One of the best business books of all time, I think, is something that literally everybody should read, not just for their business success, but if you want a better marriage, if you want to have more successful kids, Um and lots of other things, you should really know how to influence people to your way of thinking. 
And that's what the book talks about. It talks about social psychology principles that if you apply them, for example, the famous foot in the door technique, if you get somebody to give you uh, a little bit of compliance, then you can end up getting a lot of compliance later. So good marketers and salespeople use that principle. They, they get a little bit of compliance. You know, um, uh, real, uh, real estate salespeople will give out a magnet with their face on it. People accept that magnet. Oh, okay, now you've done that. Maybe it's time for the next thing. Um, you know, with, with content marketing, for example, one of the innovations that uh, I had uh, at my company was uh, around this idea was to get people to provide a little bit of information, right? So for example, just your favorite color and your first name, that's it. We're not going to get you to fill out a big form. Mm. And then all you do is you make the ebook that color. Now the ebook's purple. And now we address you by name, Alex. So, um, you know, what we've done is you've, you've got a little bit of compliance by filling out this little form then later what you might get be able to do is get a lot more compliance. You get people to fill out a much longer form. So just one example of leveraging a principle of social psychology in order to improve performance. Um, so, but I'm so glad we could share Like one of the joys of being an entrepreneur is having, you know, conversations with smart, you know, super experienced entrepreneurs, thought leaders like yourself and, you know, it's a privilege to share that with our audience. Thank you so much. I hope you reach out to Mark, um, whether you want to change the world or change a category or create one. And at a minimum, as, as to to uh, uh, to Mark's uh, kind of key inspirational points, to really delight a group of people that are, you know, sharing your, your mission and vision for how the world should be. Thank you, Mark, so much. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure.